Roman mythology offers plenty of gods associated with the natural world. Just look at Neptune and his dominion over the sea, or Luna's role as goddess of the moon. Yet it also offers a god of nature itself in the form of Sylvanus. But he was so much more than just a nature god. People made offerings to Sylvanus to help protect their livestock and ensure a good harvest. Farmers might offer him their first fruits from the harvest as thanks for his help. And as a god of boundaries, he could also protect your fields and your home. And this gives us an indication as to why Sylvanus is such a fascinating figure. Popular with the people rather than the elites, Sylvanus gives us an insight into personal Roman religion. And of course this dovetails nicely with the study of folklore, what ordinary people practiced or believed. But let's find out who Sylvanus was and why he was so popular in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there, and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, A.C. Sedgwick. I'm going to apologise in advance if my voice sounds a little bit weird. It turns out I have strained vocal cords, according to the ENT clinic that I went to on Tuesday, and I wasn't really given any indication as to what to do about it, other than maybe resting them. But if you've ever met me in person, you'll know that I do talk a lot. So I will go and rest them when I finish recording this episode. So I hope that you enjoyed the break last week from the podcast obviously on that particular Saturday I was sightseeing around Helsinki which was quite cool because it did mean that I got to see not one but two haunted theatres which I had written about in an article for a travel magazine which is quite cool but anyway we are starting this particular theme with Sylvanus the Roman god of nature and other things besides because he was actually a listener request and I thought well we'll start with him And we are going to have a look at some other deities who sometimes seem to have been a little bit maligned, shall we say. So I will let you know that next week we are looking at Juno, who basically has been a bit of a victim of a smear campaign, essentially. She's had quite a lot of bad PR, so we're going to have a look at her next week. But as I say, this week is Sylvanus, who I thought, oh, this is going to be really easy. There's going to be absolutely loads about him. But there's actually fewer myths than I was expecting. And it's probably best to just start off with who Sylvanus actually was. Now, unlike many of the other Roman gods, you won't find him in the so-called family tree. And that's where you get gods like Jupiter, who's father of Minerva and so on and things like that. Sylvanus doesn't really appear in that. And instead, he's usually associated with forests, hunting, vegetation and sometimes water. He's sometimes depicted as being something of a Pan-like figure, although as we shall see, he is not a substitute for Pan. The Romans saw him very much as being his own being. And as we will find with gods, he's not actually as simple as I've just made him sound. Because, yes, he's a god of the forests, but more specifically, he's often considered the god of forests which bordered areas that were yet to be conquered. So this gave him something of a liminal quality as the land was not quite civilised and not quite wild. And this is what made him the guardian of borders as well. Virgil considered him a god of fields and cattle, which does make sense given his scope within rural areas. And unlike many gods, Sylvanus really did remain a rural deity. So while he might represent both forests and agricultural land, he very much had little to do with cities. Now, according to Robert E. Palmer, Sylvanus was also worshipped in gardens or orchards to protect the growth and strangely also at cemeteries to help protect health as well. Now, his domain was extended to include fruit as well as plants and trees and wine was common at his feasts, which is probably why we see a little bit of crossover sometimes between Sylvanus and Bacchus. Now, this should give you an idea of the sorts of things that fell under his protection and he's usually considered benevolent, although there are some ancient sources which actually discuss the danger that he posed to women during childbirth. Now, one of the things that made Sylvanus so fascinating is his importance to so-called regular people and his appearance in day-to-day religion. Now, this is very different from the pomp and ceremony enjoyed by gods such as Mars or Fortuna. And obviously there are episodes on both of those already. But they have like massive feast days and they appear in the public calendar and there's holy days and they've got temples and processions and this, that and the other. 
that's kind of almost like state religion, as it were. And Sylvanus didn't have any of that. So he had no temple. There were no holy days dedicated to him, no public feasts. And this was largely because he was unimportant to the social elite. However, being unofficial doesn't actually mean that he was less important than other gods. He just had a different audience because popularity was measured through a whole variety of means, not just official recognition. Now, we will come back to that in a minute, but it is worth bearing in mind that his was a so-called private cult, not a public one. And that basically just meant that individuals or communities worshipped him rather than whole cities or regions worshipping him on a national level. Now, the lack of a national priesthood does suggest that rich aristocrats weren't attracted to Sylvanus, but he did gain popularity at the same time that the more traditional gods were beginning to lose favour. So it does seem like Sylvanus continued to offer something that other gods perhaps maybe didn't or couldn't. And I do think that this fact that you could approach him on a much more private level probably had something to do with it. Now, some people outside of Rome also still sought Sylvanus' protection. So, for example, a Roman citizen in Keenshim in Somerset actually had an altar dedicated to Sylvanus in his villa. So that means you could wonder, was he trying to protect his home in an outpost of the empire? But this is the kind of thing that you come across. And we will come back to the sheer number of altars dedicated to him later on in the episode. Now, some scholars have suggested that only men worshipped Sylvanus, but there are some dedications to him by women. Now, because of the fact that these women could have made a dedication to Fauna, who was considered his female counterpart, but they instead chose to dedicate to Sylvanus, it does therefore suggest, as Michael Lipka points out, that worship of the god wasn't restricted to men after all. However, there was one of his rituals from rural areas which involved an annual sacrifice to ensure the health of all the livestock and some people say that that was the kind of ritual that only men or indeed slaves could actually participate in or view women were banned from that so this is where some of this idea of was he men only that's where some of that comes from Now, what was quite interesting is people actually only needed a sanctified statue to worship him, not an entire temple. So you could essentially set that up anywhere that you wanted to make sacred to Sylvanus and groves or the woods seem quite popular locations for his worship. And there has been some consternation about whether he was the god of cultivated land or of forests, although... We do have to remember that the meaning of gods could change because let's remember Mars did begin as an agricultural deity and then later became the god of war. So it's entirely possible that Sylvanus was the god of cultivated land and of forests. It doesn't necessarily have to be an either or. And indeed, early records do speak of a Mars Sylvanus, but it's not clear if Sylvanus was just one of Mars's early epithets or if they were in fact separate gods. Now, obviously, types of worship did vary across the 300-year period that spans the time in which archaeological evidence has been found, and Sylvanus has also changed form from where he was syncretised with other deities. But the one thing that is quite easy to see, despite the fact it's quite hard to pinpoint his origins, it's really easy to see his popularity. And his cult was absolutely widespread in the Western Empire. He appears on several hundred statues, rings, reliefs, mosaics, bronzes, frescoes and even sarcophagi. And if we go by inscriptions, he actually comes fifth and that's only behind Jupiter, Hercules, Fortuna and Mercury. And that's in terms of the number of dedications made to him. In Rome itself, he's second only to Jupiter in terms of the number of inscriptions. And again, there is an episode about Jupiter, but considering that he's kind of the supreme god over all of them, to come second to him, I think you're doing quite well. Now, the popularity of Sylvanus among the lower classes, including the slaves, also exposes how Roman religion was just as subject to class as everything else was. Still, there wasn't any movement to ask for public temples and festivals, so it does seem that people were quite happy to worship Sylvanus in their own way. Now, he does only start appearing on official monuments and coins at the the beginning of the 2nd century, but once he does start appearing, he appears in droves. Now, unreliable authors, and I must say that does include our old friend Pliny the Elder, often imagine sites associated with Sylvanus existing on the Capitoline Hill or in the Forum whereas later sources tend to see these groves as lying outside the walls that mark the religious edge of Rome. Now, this is possibly because newcomers to the city actually felt it was unwise to continue their worship in the urban environment, and given what Sylvanus was believed to preside over, that makes a lot of sense. So instead, they chose to continue holding their rights in much more rural areas. 
And indeed, Peter F. Dorsey suggests that the popularity of the Sylvanas cult in cities came from nostalgia for rural ways among people who moved to urban environments. But as I say, he wasn't just popular in Rome. You do find stuff right across the empire for him. And as an example, as well as the villa in Somerset that I mentioned before, there's an inscription at Bird Oldsworld on Hadrian's Wall, and that one was actually dedicated by a group of hunters. There was a bronze ring found in Essex that actually had an inscription on it which may have been worn by a cult member to access meetings. A small bronze stag was discovered at Colchester and that one had a nearby plaque that read To the god Sylvanus, Hermes willingly and gladly fulfils his obligation. Now his cult was also popular in Dalmatia and Pannonia and that's the region that now includes Austria, Hungary, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Slovenia, Montenegro and Serbia. So you can see that there's quite a large series of areas where Sylvanus appears and there's also other places as well, but they're kind of the main ones that I managed to find discussion of. Now, as I say, he's really, really common in statues and so on. And he is represented in a range of ways, depending on where the representation is found. So in Italy, he's often dressed in a tunic or he might wear a pine cone covered mantle. And if he's not wearing that, he's naked. Other sources say that he wears a wolf skin, carries a sickle or wields a cypress branch and we'll come back to why in a minute. And he's often bearded and is accompanied by a dog. Tibor Grohl notes that this is Sylvanus as a gardener, which is very different from the goat god alternative that we see elsewhere. And that particular version sees Sylvanus as very much being like the god of the wild. So he cares for mountains and shepherds and flocks. And this version of Sylvanus has the lower body and horns of a goat. And Grohl suggests that while these two representations might seem wildly different, they actually show the two sides of nature. So you've got the tamed by humans and then the completely wild. So both of these versions of Sylvanus, while they might look opposed, actually kind of are the two sides of the same coin. In the Dalmatian hinterland, Sylvanus is young, beardless, horned and has goat legs. So you can see why people might have confused him with Pan, while on the coast he was an old bearded man. Now, he does sometimes wear a crown of pine twigs in reliefs, which is another motif to link him to the forests. And pine, cypress, ash, anise and lilies were all dedicated to Sylvanus. I know why cypress was, but I'm not entirely sure why lilies were popular with him. But there we go. He sometimes pictured holding like a bunch of them. He does also have companions in the form of the Sylvani or nymphs. And much of the evidence doesn't really clarify whether they were nymphs of the woods, fields, rivers or mountains. But either way, they're just these nature nymphs that he seems to spend time with. The relationship between him and them seems quite a positive one. There doesn't seem to be the violence or anything like that that you get between gods and other groups of nymphs. That's quite nice. And there are some scholars who think that the Sylvani might have given an extra incentive for women to follow the cult. So where they may not have necessarily been able to participate in rights towards Sylvanus himself, they would have the Sylvani instead. Now, in terms of myths, he does appear in far fewer myths than a lot of the other gods do. And much like Fortuna, he appears to be a deity that people actively worshipped and asked for help rather than just existing in these kind of overarching myths in the way that I think Jupiter does. But a few myths do exist. So in one story, Sylvanus loved a young man named Supressus who had a tame deer. Now, Sylvanus accidentally killed the deer. It does seem like that was very much not his intention. And Suppressus died from grief. And then when he died, he turned into a cypress tree. And the somewhat bereft Sylvanus often carried a cypress branch with him as a tribute to Suppressus. So that both explains where the cypress tree comes from and why Sylvanus carries a branch of it. The other one that people seem to relate quite often is the story in which Sylvanus fell in love with Pomona, the goddess of fruit trees, gardens and orchards. And in a lot of ways, that would be a couple that would make sense, given the overlap in their domain. However, Pomona wanted to remain single and she was apparently somewhat put off by his advanced age. So that particular love affair didn't get off the ground either. But either way, Sylvanus does occasionally seem to be a god who's often crossed in love, but there doesn't seem to be any indication that he essentially did anything about this other than perhaps feeling a little bit sad. So again, that makes him quite an interesting figure. He is sometimes seen in the company of other gods, though, most often Diana, the goddess of hunting in the forest, which again would make sense. And indeed, he does appear with her in some locations around the UK. So they kind of make quite an interesting and quite obvious in some ways pairing now they're not put together as a couple it's just they're kind of seen as this pair that people would worship 
And he's also sometimes put alongside Epona, the Celtic horse goddess, and the pair actually had a joint cult in some of the territories that had been occupied by the Celts. So again, Sylvanus makes a lot of sense putting him alongside Epona. So it's quite interesting the where he is put with other gods. There is kind of sort of an obvious link there. But ultimately, what do we actually make of Sylvanus? Well, in many ways, I do think he exemplifies the idea of a nature god through his protection of both woods and trees. Yet his additional protection of uncultivated lands, be they fields or orchards, is a really good reminder that many spaces can be considered nature even if humans manage them. So I think that he's quite a good reminder of that that we might need to sort of bring back to the forefront of our minds these days. He is probably most important for his somewhat personal relationship with his worshippers, the fact that it was a relationship that people could manage themselves and they could make offerings to him for particular things that related almost to domestic and farm life. So he becomes a much more practical god in that regard. Now, it's not clear how people actually worshipped him because obviously with it being personal religion, these kind of things haven't been set down in the same way that the state festivals are. But there is some kind of understanding that people maybe found some kind of way to worship him that worked for them. They would obviously still use the same format of offerings and so on. But without an official feast day, people had a bit more flexibility, I think, in terms of when they could do that. But ultimately, I think we can look at his longevity in terms of how long he was worshipped and the sheer number of inscriptions. Both of these things are a really good testament to his popularity with ordinary people and the fact that he seemed to actually have an impact on the lives of ordinary people in a way that I think some of the bigger state gods perhaps didn't. It is a bit of a shame that we don't necessarily know his exact origins and obviously different writers have come up with different theories but ultimately Sylvanus is very much his own god and I think he is quite an interesting figure if you want to look into him and learn any more about him. So I hope that you enjoyed that kind of overview of Sylvanus. Like I say we will be having a look at Juno next week. We will also have a look at Vulcan during this month because Vulcan's really interesting and I know we've looked at Hephaestus before who's the Greek version of Vulcan but I wanted to specifically look at Vulcan because I think he sometimes gets a little bit overlooked which is a shame. I am considering doing Minerva purely because obviously there was evidence of worship of her in the UK which gives me that nice little link but that one is open for negotiation. So if anybody has one of the goddesses that they'd like to learn a little bit more about, then obviously feel free to let me know and I'll see what I can do. So I hope that you enjoyed this episode. I hope that you're glad that Fabulous Folklore is back. I certainly have missed doing the episode, so it's nice to be back here chatting with you now. And I'll see you next week when we get to meet Juno. Cheerio. Well, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes. So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance.